Welcome to ABC 10 in Focus. I'm Sam Ali, and today's guest with me, Bryce Burge from MarketSocialScene.com. For the people who don't know uh, much about you, give us a little bit of uh, an intro. Well, uh, first, thanks for having me here today. Uh, Market Social Scene is a blog that I created back in June of 2013. Started off as just kind of like a, a local blog that focused on different things going around Marquette and Marquette's kind of loosely defined as it is. It's one of the one of the unique aspects of the town and the area. And so there's so many things to cover. And at that point, you know, I didn't really have a reputation or anything. So it was just whatever I could get my hands on. Started with the bars, went to sports, did a lot of work with the Marquette Royals and covering them their first season. And so now it's just along the lines of a local website where people can get news that may not be picked up by other other outlets in the area and that's because I always think that somebody cares somebody cares about whatever story that's going to be popped up whether people can get to it to cover it is is another thing but somebody cares about that kind of stuff and somebody should do it uh, and now in terms of the website is it just you or is there several people who, who contribute um, writing it's pretty much me um, I've got a couple of photographers that I can pay um, to help out with different things. Um, had a couple different people help out, might have one of those guys come back for the hockey seasons. Um, and I've had a couple of great interns through Northern Michigan University. Being able to provide internships uh, in the media fields is a little, little different up here than other media markets because mm -hmm. they don't happen as frequently as other places. And mm -hmm. so I think it's pretty, pretty great to go through and provide a, an opportunity like that for, for other students. You said uh, when people think social scene, market social scene, they immediately think, oh, it's a website about uh, going here, going to this bar, going to the, you know, these events. But you do cover hard news. When it comes around, yes, especially if it has to deal with the, the bar scene or, or, that kind of, or the nightlife and that kind of stuff or what we're talking about. We covered the uh, Ileana Blackbird's uh, heroin arrest cover-up uh, because they were a rival of the Royals at the time. Um, we covered the shooting last April. Uh, we got the exclusive interview uh, with uh, Don Marple, the owner of Flanagan's, to kind of talk about the New Year's Eve stabbing. And we were the only ones that were able to go through and spell Flanagan's right. You know, eight hours, <laughs> eight hours after it all went and all went down and everything like that, and multiple news sources had already covered it. You know, we were there to you know kind of fill up with some of the information that slipped through the cracks, and so it's great to have that kind of information and that kind of ability. Um, but again, it's it's because somebody cares, and uh, you know, the role of the media is to cover that kind of stuff, and we'll go through and do that. But we also have really great social media where we'll use social media to cover things like the bar crawl you know the bar crawls that happen or art shows or uh distributor events that kind of stuff and so we we do a lot of a lot of stuff and we don't do it just in the typical blog format we'll also add it on to things like instagram or twitter uh, talking about the versatility of the website what are some of the, the differences between maybe the news gathering aspect of hard news, and some of the maybe, I guess, for lack of a better term, lighter stuff that you guys do? Well, a lot of lighter stuff is great just because everybody can be happy-go-lucky with it. Um, it was covering a story about uh, a local business that sh uh, showed almost 20% growth in the first quarter of the year. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's happy to talk to you about that kind of stuff. But other things like harder news stories, there's one that I'm investigating right now that deal with um, police records that deal with uh, complaints about lots of different things and you have to go through and you have to like talk to people regularly you have to talk to people you have to know when to push when not to push when to come back later and that's one of those things that you never really learn mm -hmm. i don't think anybody really learns no matter whether they're somebody that's just starting out in journalism they're just a regular person trying to figure something out or if they've been in this for a long time it takes a, long, a lot of work and a lot of instances to really kind of see that kind of stuff. And um, it's really challenging. But if the story is that important to go through and deal with the challenging stuff, then that means that the story is important and it should be covered. What's been the uh, feedback that you've been getting from community members about, you know, just in general of the website itself? We've had a lot of great support from people. Um, that are kind of sick and tired of, of the, the standard one newspaper, 
Uh, it was originally two, now it's three TV stations that will go through and, and felt that the media market got stagnant. Um, word on the street by Brian Cabell has also been a really influential aspect of kind of shaking up the, the media market lately, um, kind of comparing the two. You know, he kind of atta attacks it with like a, a community newsletter style format where he'll just chop things up with a hatchet into nice calm blocks where you can easily digest them. And I kind of go through with an exacto knife almost where I kind of like surgically get to it too much. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it's really great because you have so many different styles of coverage now uh, that people are finding what they're more interested in and how they're more comfortable with it. I think that's a big factor of really helping, uh, helping Marquette and the surrounding areas grow. Alrighty, that'll wrap up this segment of ABC 10 in Focus. I will be right back with Bryce Burge in just a moment. Welcome back to ABC 10 in Focus. I'm Sam Ali here with my guest Bryce Burge from the MarquetteSocialScene.com. Uh, so let's get into how you started because you've done a, a, a lot of stories and a lot of follow-ups on the situation at the Northwind. Uh, take us, I guess, from day one and how you decided to uh, tackle this story. Well, the Northwind is a really interesting conundrum in itself. It's a student newspaper that's economically liable to the university in multiple ways because if there was a lawsuit or anything like that, it falls under the purview or the umbrella, as a lot of people have called it, of Northern Michigan University. Mm -hmm. um, but yet they try to remain uh, independent in their editorial content, what actually gets put in. And so that's a really unique situation right off the bat. And you know, being on campus and dealing with a lot of the stuff that you see in the North Wind, uh, it, it was starting to, to build up into a real big fight of this is what we culturally think of, this is what the, the norm is for the area, and the North Wind was looking to shake things up. Um, whether that was their intention or not, I can't really talk on that, but they were shaking things up and they were doing different, different techniques that weren't really seen by other newspapers or other news outlets. Um, so when I kind of I kind of started paying attention and started talking to people and then I was just walking through a parking lot one day and one of the people from the Northwind was literally just driving by and said hey we didn't get our funding for a FOIA request and I was just like why are you getting charged for a FOIA in the first place mm. and so kind of went through it and and started emailing people and talking to people um, the the way things were kind of set up there there was a lot of questions right off the bat about one of the administrators who's on the board um, being both a subject of the FOIA that was not funded by the board of director mm -hmm. or board of directors of the Northwind yet he was on the bo Northwind board of dire uh, directors conflict yeah and then found out later that. that that he was one of the people of the administration that chose to charge the, the North one in the first place. So there's like multiple layers of conflict of interest that were going on and kind of dealt with that and email got statements from Derek Hall, who's done a great job of handling this, I thought for the most part. Um, they, they've really kind of gone with it. And now that we've gotten into things with people being, dis, you know, not dismissed, but not hired people that have been not brought back for their advising aspects. It's made it really interesting to kind of see where certain rights are coming into place, what laws are being broken, because there have been problems with open meeting acts not being followed. And that kind of aspect has been really interesting to cover so far because it has gotten a lot of people to ask questions on campus. and. Some of them are pro Northwind, some of them are pro administration, some of them don't care, they just think it's a soap opera. Mm -hmm. But they're paying attention in ways that people really haven't paid attention to in the past. And that makes it a compelling story. Were you present for any of those meetings uh, where obviously the person we were talking about, Cheryl Reed, uh, the faculty advisor, or the former faculty advisor, given how you're looking at it, were you present for the meetings and could you give us any insight about what was going on? I went to some of those meetings. Um, it was really interesting. The agendas were very vague, uh, so you didn't really know what was going on. Uh, there were multiple times where the advisors would kind of start bickering with each other about rights and, and what 
in, you know, best interests in, in different things. And a lot of the students were, were looking back and forth. The community uh, advisor, Kim Eggleston, did a great job of, of multiple times coming up and uh, trying to explain what rights were. And, and now it's kind of, it, the whole thing with Cheryl Reed has, in, in the North Wind itself has not been just one key factor or one key event that, that d did everything. It was really just this, the hay pile that's been building up and finally it just got too big and it collapsed on itself. Tell us about the meeting that uh, you were, I don't want to kicked out of is a little too harsh, but about that meeting. All right, so through the course of my investigation, I had found multiple, to multiple times where the board of directors of the Northwind uh, violated Open Meetings Act. Uh, they had serial meetings away from the rest of the groups, um, which are not allowed. Um, they had issues with closing meetings when they shouldn't have closed meetings, or they have not expressed why they needed to close them, including the meeting right before I got thrown out. So when it came to that meeting, everything seemed okay. Um, they were going into a closed session uh, for interviews, which they're allowed to do. That's a legal thing. But then about five, ten minutes went on, and nobody was in there to be interviewed. There's a glass door. Mm -hmm. on, on the room, nothing was there, so I knocked on the door and said, hey, what part of the meeting is this? Because they've had problems with this in the past. There's no room, there's no benefit of the doubt anymore if they're breaking the law that much. And so for dealing with that, I knocked on the door, said, what part of the meeting is this? Nye Heisel said that I had to go, the administrator on the board. Um, a couple other people thought that I had to leave too, and I said, well, I'm legally allowed to question it. And then everybody got quiet besides Nyheisel and then um, Reed said that I was allowed to question the meeting and because I wasn't going in there to protest. I wasn't in there to cause problems. I was going in there because I questioned the validity of this closed session and that was a big deal. And they said, you got to go. And I said, no. And then they said, well, you got to go now because here's Mike Bath, the director of public safety, who mm -hmm. was at the meeting. And so when Mike Bath told me le uh, to go, I left. That's in accordance with the law. And so I didn't want to break the law myself, so I left. We'll uh, definitely get a little bit more because I do want to get <laughs> your reaction to this whole thing, but we'll, uh, we'll be right back right after this. Welcome back to ABC 10 In Focus. I'm Sam Ali with my guest, Bryce Burge from MarketSocialScene.com. All right, I guess uh, finish off <laughs> this great, it's a, it's a fascinating story for me. I know it was an unfortunate situation, but okay, so they asked you to leave, you left. Uh, did you? I was, I was very unhappy about leaving. I do want to point that out. I was. I was. Uh, who I, I was very snarky uh, in the process of leaving. Now, t tell me, did you file a complaint? What happened afterwards with that incident? I chose not to file a complaint because that was part of a two-part meeting. They that meeting because they had so much stuff going on. They were going to break it up into two parts, um, and I felt you know at that point if if things were just going to be normal in the second part of it if there was going to be no problems then you know at this point that's adding to the issue and if i'm going to go in there to cover things i probably shouldn't add to it mm -hmm. i should you know take the more mature route um unfortunately i did get called into the dean of students office wow uh for violating student code and when i when i talked to the dean of students chris greer uh she said, you know, we're not going to charge you, but we don't want this to happen again, which I thought was fair. And we kind of just, you know, discussed it a little bit. But what it came down to is that there was one aspect of a student code, um, which is 2.3.5.01, which is where any person acting as an official of the university can tell you to do something. And if it's reasonable and lawful, you have to do it. It's one of the most oppressive things I've ever seen in student code. Um, from looking at the other 15 public universities in the state. And um, they, they cited that, and so I responded with the actual Open Meetings Act, mm -hmm. which is if you, throw some, if you have a closed session where people are coming in, you either move it to a different location or you call the cops to have them leave. And so when, when Mike Bath from Public Safety told me to le leave, I left. But in that case, it doesn't matter if an administrator or an official from the university tells me that I have to, I have to leave, especially if they're on the board. It's, I'm following the law at this case, and so that request to leave was not viewed as lawful, so I didn't have to do it. 
um, it kind of worked out. Um, they had their talks from what I heard and, and it all worked itself out. Uh, in terms of the open, open meetings, uh, give us a sense of uh, how NMU was doing it or how they were making it look like in terms of the agenda. Was it right for them to, to be doing all these in terms of, I guess, the letter of the law? Well, that, that's kind of a, a complex co uh, question to ask because one, a lot of people don't know the specific Civil Meetings Act. Um, Open Meetings Act, they originally started out in Florida as a state law and then it went to all 50 states. They're different based on the state itself, uh, which is a big deal. So Michigan, they have their own setup, and so you can go into closed sessions for hiring, you can go into any kind of personnel stuff, if you're selling parcels of land. Um, and then what was the other one? Um, Oh, uh, collective bargaining contracts. Mm -hmm. uh, so that way, if, you, if you're if you working on a contract or something like that, then you can talk in private so that way the other side can't get an unfair advantage. Um, so when that kind of stuff comes along, there are reasons why to go to closed stuff. And then the other thing, too, is that it's not necessarily NMU in this case. In this case, it's the no Northwind Board of Directors, which has the two advisors, five students, a community member, and a faculty member. So there's nine members on this board. That, it's this board that's having a lot of the problems from what I've been stu uh, studying because I haven't seen this problem with other groups on campus. And so, and then on top of it, the board of directors for the North one is really, really problematic in itself too because it has to deal with stuff with the First Amendment. And so things are way more increased in terms of how stressful it can be. Um, because you have to nail it because of the First Amendment aspects. You, mm -hmm. can, you can look at a First Amendment aspect and then just blow past it by just asking a reasonable request because it's so close, it's so razor thin of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable that you can blow right past that line and not even know it. And so I think that's happened a lot this, this year with, with the Board of Directors. And whether they go into a closed session or not, that's, that really should be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. They didn't go into a proper closed session, the meeting beforehand. Um, things that happened at that meeting led me to believe that what was going on in there uh, was not matching up with the agenda, which is a big part of that too, because now there's evidence and then there's also watching and seeing what people are going through with um, by looking through the door. and so. I thought there was a problem with that one. And it goes by a case-by-case -case basis. And I think that's really ha how you have to look at all these meetings, whether it's a city commission meeting or something at Northern, like a board like this, or, or, or anything like that. All right, that'll wrap up this segment of ABC 10 in Focus. And we'll be right back right after this. Welcome back to ABC 10 in Focus. I'm Sam Ali, here with my guest, Bryce Burge from MarketSocialScene.com. So uh, FOIAs, Freedom yes. of Information Act, uh, I guess, what are they and how would somebody apply for them? Basically, in, in the most simplest mm -hmm. terms. Basically, it is a tool that every citizen has the ability to use, uh, whether they're a journalist or a businessman or anything like that. And a Freedom of Information Act is basically where you submit uh, for documentation uh, regarding a certain issue or topic or time frame or person uh, to go through and uh, learn information about a public body. Mm -hmm. uh, emails, uh, some states do text messages, um, but the thing is that, it, again, it's like Open Meetings Act. They're different but based state by state. Michigan is one of the ones that um, will be changing mm -hmm. their, their Freedom of Information Act uh, laws on July 1st, so that will make things more cost affordable for the average citizen or journalists. Um, but typically, journalists don't get charged for FOIA requests. I've never been charged for one. Um, I wanted to ask, did you yeah. ever look into why NMU was charging? Or did they give a reason why? Um, they thought it was an educational experience from, from the people that I talked to. Um, that uh, Freedom of Information Act, based on who uses it, depends on if there's pay sometimes. anybody You can charge anybody, really. But a lot of groups that are forthwith and coming uh, about what they are doing, they'll say, well, this is a public good, people should know, we'll charge you less, it won't be like printing fees or something like that, mm -hmm. or they'll just not, they'll waive it. Um, some, if you're like a business owner, um, I FOIA'd NMU's FOIA log, for example, I got to see who 
uh, submitted Freedom of Information Acts over a five year span and there were like business owners, textbook buybacks, companies, um, military groups that were looking for, for names and emails of graduating people to recruit a little bit more. Uh, so those kind of groups may be paid uh, or may be charged for that kind of stuff, but usually journalists don't, at least not that I've ever come across through. And I've submitted these in multiple states now. Is there any case where a person who the, fo the FOIA is being filed on can decline, can say, no, we can't? Or uh, is there a certain time frame? Because I know that was one of the issues with the Northwind and NMU mm -hmm. on one of the FOIAs where it was just taking up too much time. Yeah, and th that's gone both ways. Uh, Starbucks, the, the Starbucks FOIA, mm -hmm. they went through and said that that took too long. Um, it, it went past the amount of time that you're, you're legally allowed to be, or legally allowed to, to take uh, from the state of Michigan. So that's a big factor. But I know in the Lenovo case, uh, where the, there was a FOIA that the North one asked again, um, they said, uh, Northern said, hey, would you come, on, uh, come in and take a look at this kind of stuff? We'll give you it, but we don't want to print all this stuff. We don't want to have somebody scan it. Would you take a look? Um, so it kind of goes both ways about how people want to play it. They can play hardball. They can do it nicely. One thing about Michigan, though, is that you always have to do it in writing, and that, that kind of makes things weird for people. Like, well, why didn't you just ask for it? I was like, well, because it's not an official Freedom of Information Act request then. In other states, you can say, I would like uh, base salaries of this coach uh, under the Freedom of Information Act, blah, 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 blah. You have to give it to me. But in this state, you actually have to write it out. You have to send it to a specific person uh, to get that information. I guess uh, as a person who's really involved with social media and uh, you, know, you got your website and everything, uh, what's been your reaction to how much uh, attention this has been getting outside of the UP? I think the people outside the UP really understand that this is a First Amendment issue, that this is literally, this is literally a federal court case now. Uh, so when that comes into play, people are, are paying attention to it. Uh, Huffington Post picked it up. The only time that Huffington Post has ever talked about Northern Michigan University is the Northwind scandal, the threat day where they were shut down over a 4chan post, uh, uh, I think in 2011 or 12, and when Obama came up here. And so that's the only time that Huffington Post has really cared about Northern, but the Free Press, the Times, uh, Grand Rapids uh, had some stuff on television about it. NPR picked it up statewide, uh, so it was in Lansing. Um, I've had friends and graduates that have paid attention from around the state uh, have realized that this is a big deal because now you're getting to a lot of the cultural questions that that students or community members have kind of experienced about the UP where as much as we all like it up here, there's kind of a p premium put on politeness and mm -hmm. not rocking the boat. And, and this kind of stuff is definitely rocking the boat and people have fallen on both sides of it. And um, I, think, I think when the court case comes up, uh, if you actually get a chance to read the court case, I put the full filing up on Marquette social scene. If you read all 49 points that uh, Cheryl Reed and Michael Williams, because that's a real big part here too, is that it's two people suing five people, mm -hmm. and it's not just one bad teacher versus four, you know, four students. Uh, so it's that kind of factor makes it really interesting, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Alrighty, thank you very much. Thank Rice, you. For appreciate joining it. Me. I appreciate that. That'll wrap up ABC 10 in Focus. Join us again next week for another edition.